Hello, this is Russell Moore, and you're listening to The Russell Moore Show, brought to you by Christianity Today. Every week, we explore here conversations and questions from a Christian perspective to help you sort out how to live as a follower of Jesus in confusing times. And this week, we have a conversation to seek to do just that. Kids are not all right. According to study after study after study, we have record highs when it comes to anxiety and depression and other uh, mental disorders. And even apart from that, uh, just being around a lot of adolescents, there seems to be such a heightened level of stress. I have read the galleys of a book that I think is amazing and is going to be a decades-long conversation driver. And that's really weird because most people don't ever have one like that, but it's really odd for somebody to have two. And if you think about my guest today, Jonathan Haidt, who is social psychologist at New York University Stern School of Business, he wrote the book, uh, The Righteous Mind, which not only have we quoted so many times here, but it seems as though every kind of meeting that I'm in, even when they're completely different religiously or politically or in any other way, cites that book and the work done in that book. Well, here here comes another one that I think is going to do uh, the same thing about the issue we're talking about today. It's called The Anxious Generation, How the Great Rewiring of Childhood is Causing an Epidemic of Mental Illness, and it will be coming out soon, so you'll want to you want to keep your eye out for it. Jonathan Haidt, thanks for being with us today. What a pleasure, Russell. It's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure to talk to you, and, and uh, I, I appreciate your work, and, and I appreciate the many conversations I've had with you. You argue something really is different mm-hmm. now. That's right. That's right. So, you know, every generation since the time of Plato and Aristotle has thought the one after them is soft. There are certain things that are normal <laughs> misunderstandings between generations. But this is the first time that all of the indicators on the dashboard are flashing red. That is, it's not just that we misunderstand each other. It's that levels of anxiety and depression and self-harm and suicide all began going up at the same time. Suicide a little bit earlier, suicide begins to go up around 2008, 2009, but everything else goes skyrocketing around 2012. There's there's really very little sign of a, of a mental health crisis in 2010. If you, if you just looked at all the trends until 2010, you'd say things are as, they, as they've always been. But then all of a sudden, the levels begin going up, especially for girls. And here's the kicker. Everyone has a theory as to why it goes up around 2011, 2012. But it's always like, oh, you know, because of you know, school shootings or it's something about America. Mm-hmm. Well, the exact same thing happened in Canada, the UK, Australia, happened in the Scandinavian countries. So there is no other theory. There is no, nobody's even proposed another theory other than it's when kids stop seeing each other in person and they move their lives onto their devices. You go from the play-based childhood to a phone-based childhood around 2011, 2012 is when most kids switch over from a flip phone to, a, to an iPhone. And that's when the mental health crisis begins. All the dashboard lights begin flashing red and they've gotten worse and worse every year since then. So it's not a COVID-related pandemic stress uh, sort of marker. It's, it predates that. That's right. So a lot of people think that it, this was caused by COVID and it wasn't at all. I was writing about this. Jean Twenge was the first to notice this and with her book, iGen. Jean Twenge was the first to say, look, something's going terribly wrong. She said that in 2016, 2017. A lot of people said, oh, no, you're overinterpreting. Nah, it's just, you know, correlation, nothing. But the numbers have gotten worse and worse since then. And in 2019, when I started on this project, things were looking terrible. And Jean and I and others started saying, what kids most need is less time on their devices and more time out playing with each other. And then COVID comes in, what happens? We say, oh no kids, you can't go outside Mm -hmm. and play with each other because you might transmit COVID. How about you spend all day on your devices? And so Mm. COVID made things worse, but actually kids were, American children were already socially distanced by 2019. That is 
kids used to spend a lot of time with each other. Kids used to see their friends. That's what kids do until around 2012. And then the number of the hours spent per week with friends drops and drops and drops so that by 2019, it's already so low that when COVID restrictions come in, it just goes down a little bit more. So all of this was baked in before COVID. I was talking uh, the other day to Amanda Ripley, mm. oh, I love author her of uh, High Conflict. She's she's amazing. And she she said at one point to me, I don't know how you survived. And then she, she talked about some experiences that I had had in the past. And I thought about that later. And I thought, well, you know, I would say grace of God, but how did that grace of God come about? And one of the key things, I think, was the way that my parents responded to me. Mm. And and if I would go out in the morning when it wasn't a school day, be in the woods, I'm in the woods all day long, or I'm with one of my friends riding bicycles all day long. Nobody knew where I was. Nobody had a GPS tracker on me or, or anything like that. And I had no way to contact my parents if something had happened. But it actually, I think, was necessary for me to, to learn how to live. That's right. And you talk about in this book the difference between a play-based childhood and safetyism. Mm-hmm. That's, what, what, what's safetyism? That's right. so, so safetyism is the worship of safety. Of course, we want our kids to be safe, but mm-hmm. there are lots of conflicting values. And if you take one value and say, safety trumps everything else, So a tiny reduction in risk is worth sacrificing thousands of hours of play outside. And it's true that if you never let your kid out, they'll never be abducted. But then again, if you do let your kid out, they'll never be abducted either. There's essentially zero abduction in this country, other than by the non-custodial parent in a divorce proceeding. But safetyism is the worship of safety to the point where we are paranoid and we convey that paranoia to our kids and we teach them that the world is dangerous you can't cope with it, and bad people will hurt you if you go out in it. And so what you were describing before is what you might call a hunter-gatherer childhood. I believe that's what we evolved for. Uh, We evolved uh, in the woods, essentially, for millions of years. And the, the whole evolution of childhood is about kids mastering skills that they'll need as adults. And so that then when they reach adulthood, they actually are competent. But what we began doing in the 90s, just as the crime rate was dropping, there was a big crime wave when you and I were growing up. There was a crime. There was a, a big explosion of crime in the 70s and 80s. In the 90s, those rates drop. It gets really safe, but we freak out about child abduction, and we say kids can't go out on their own. You can't go play in a park. It's too dangerous. You'll be abducted. And so satanic panic. Yeah. Yes, that's right. There was there was a lot of that. There were daycare panics. There were all kinds of panics. We we stopped trusting each other. That's one of the big things. We stopped trusting other adults. And so I imagine when you were a kid. If you got in trouble, you could go to somebody's house or an adult might step in. Adults were looking out for the kids, right? Is that true when you were growing up? They gave me the space, it seemed, to learn how to be. And there was a safety net. I knew there was a safety net there, but they Mm -hmm. had me walk the rope. Well, that's right. But that brings in a few additional elements to what a healthy childhood is. And so Mm -hmm. I'll just put two words out there. One is community and the other is mentors. And so it doesn't make any sense for us to only learn from our parents. There's no reason to think your parents know everything. And so all over the world, especially once kids reach around age 9, 10, 11, they get really interested in adult activities and, oh, look at this carpenter. And, and you know, so kids are sort of, gla- they're, they're looking at what adults are doing and then other adults are taking an interest in them. So kids need to learn from multiple adults. And that largely has mm. stopped. We don't trust other adults. We think they're going to sexually molest them. Mm. And the other key word, as I said, is community. It was only late in writing the book. You know, I, I worked on this book for a long time. And near the end, I realized, wait a second, one of the biggest concepts here is community versus networks. So a community is a group of real people who are kind of stuck together. You can't just come and go as you please. It takes a while to get in. It's hard to get out. And so you have to get along with each other. Human children need to be embedded in communities. And I would say a religious community is the quintessential perfect community because it's full, it's saturated with moral meaning. Kids need moral guidance. They need a sense that there is a way the world ought to be and I need to learn it and conform to it. So kids need to be raised in human communities. But what happened after about 2012 is there was no more time for that. It was all about networks. 
And what are these networks? A network of followers on Facebook, on Instagram. You can come in, you can go, you don't use your real name. So it's transient, it's not binding, and it's not much of a moral community. So actually, what you described, to me, sounds like actually the perfect human childhood with other adults and a lot of freedom, and you made mistakes. And I bet sometimes you were scared, sometimes you probably got hurt, but made it home. That's what you need to do. Well, what changed in terms of, I mean, I know what what changed in terms of the kids, or, or you've convinced me of that after reading this book, but why did we end up with such anxious parents? Mm. I mean, you, you talk about it, this, I had to chuckle when you mentioned a merry-go-round on a yeah. playground, and uh, I, mean, I know at our school, and I'll bet at your school, there was sort of a rickety merry-go-round that was just, you know, could go up to 90 miles yep. an hour if you pushed it fast enough. Yep. <laughs> and it would never be allowed on any oh, playground. Oh, no, that's right, now. that's right. No, I mean, I still have those visceral feelings, like you lie back, and as you get closer to the edge, the centrifugal forces are, are you know, they're <laughs> harder on your head than on your feet, you know, and you try to like stand. And, it's so, and, and yeah, it's dangerous, but that's actually a benefit. Because if you have kids playing on a playground where it's possible to get hurt, then they learn every day how to not get hurt. But if we always keep kids in a situation where they can't get hurt, they don't learn how to not get hurt. And so the Europeans are actually way ahead of us. In Britain, they, where they have fewer lawyers and fewer fears of, you know, of liability, they've begun putting construction materials in playgrounds, put bricks and lumber, mm. let kids make things out of bricks and lumber. And yeah, they're going to pinch their fingers and something's going to fall on their foot, but they learn how to handle these construction materials. And in America, we don't do that. We say, if anyone can get hurt, we're going to ban it. If there's a snowball fight and someone gets hit, we ban snowball fights. And so we're, you know, we're, we're penny wise and pound foolish here. We're, we're, we're trying to, and that's safetyism. We, we want absolute levels of safety, which means we have fragile kids who are more likely to kill themselves. So, so how did the parents get that way? I mean, it's, it's not as though previous generations of parents had a, a manual that was mm-hmm. lost somewhere in the in the 80s or 90s, early 2000s. What what happened to the yeah. parents? Because it seems that that kind of safetyism predates the 2012 era that mm-hmm. we've been talking right. about with smartphones. Well, in a way, in a way, actually, parents did have a manual, and it was lost. For all of mm. human history, there were babies around. And there were women taking care of babies, and there were women nursing babies, and there were girls, you know, seven, eight, ten-year-old girls were helping care for the babies. And there was wisdom about how to raise children passed down, especially among the women. But, you know, men saw it too. Uh, And there were large families. And so there was an accumulation of wisdom for thousands of years, and certainly up until the 40s, 50s, even into the 60s, there was that. But then birth rates plunge. Divorce rates rise, women enter the workforce, people are spending more time in school, they're spending more time at work, and by the 90s, that generational knowledge passed down in any community is now very thin, it's kind of shredding, it's not really there. So what happens? Then add on one more thing, a kind of a professionalization, an idea, especially as and I'm, take, I'm drawing here from Alison Gopnik. She has this wonderful book, The Gardener and the Carpenter. She lays this out. As, as people get more educated, as the professional class goes to school more, they begin to treat child rearing like a school project. Hmm, let me just Ooh. read the right, the right manual. Let me read the right expert, and then I'll do it right, and then my kid will come out like a, a genius. And that doesn't work. Kids are not like that. You can't just like shape. That's the, you, you can't be like a carpenter trying to make a kid. You have to be a gardener creating a garden, and then plants are going to grow. You want to pull out the bad weeds, but ultimately the plants are going to grow. And so if you think of parenting as a, a gardener, you're going to get the best outcome you can. But but especially educated people became carpenters. That produces kids who are not as healthy, I should say, as a gardening parent. I thought several times while reading your book about another book that was really uh, influential on me as well that came out in the past couple of years, M.R. O'Connor's book, Wayfinding, mm-hmm. in which the, the argument is human beings don't have homing instincts the way that uh, birds do, say. And so part of what it means to learn how to navigate life is by walking mm-hmm. and by learning to, when one gets lost find one's way back, uh, that that actually is a key part of uh, growing up. And I, I think you, you, look at, uh, you look at the Bible 
And there's that pattern there, almost exactly what you describe as a secure base. Mm -hmm. So there are pillars and monuments, mm -hmm. Ebenezer and <clears throat> Bethel, and, but there also is this sense of you, you don't know where you're going and there's something preparatory mm -hmm. uh, about yeah. that. With that, that secure base, I mean, how, how does a parent achieve that? Mm. So, so what you're asking about there is what's called the attachment system in psychology. Uh, and it was really studied and laid out by John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth back in the 40s and 50s. And what they showed is that human childhood is about a child having, needing a secure base that they can go to whenever there's a threat, when things are frightening. But the point of the secure base is not just to keep the child safe. The point is to give the child the confidence to go explore off base, because that's where all the mm. learning takes place. You don't learn very much when you're clinging to your mother, but if you have a mother you can depend on, then, and you'll see this in toddlers, they'll wander off, they're really curious. They'll wander off, maybe they'll even go out of sight. And if something bad happens, they might come running back. But as they get more confident, they don't come running back at every little thing. They can stay out longer, they can learn more. And so we have to see the, the whole point of safety is not to just prevent the child from being eaten or abducted, it's to encourage the child to leave the base and explore. With smartphones, mm. well, one of the things that I've noticed is that when, when that topic comes up, it feels a lot to me like the conversation about climate change for a lot of people, which is not that they disbelieve that climate change is happening, but it seems so big to yeah. them that they say, well, what could I, what could I do about it? I mean, so there, there's a, a sense in which both with parents, but also with people who, who will say, my smartphone is really messing with me, but I mean, it's 2023, what are you gonna do? Mm -hmm. That seems to be the attitude That's right. uh, there. That's right. It seems to be, right, it seems to be something so big, what can we do? And, and so the, the key idea I wanna introduce here is called a collective action problem. There are certain things that are impossible to solve as an individual, but if we all work together, then they're easy to solve. And the, the, the phones are, are a classic social science collective action problem. So you take the view, I'm sure many of your listeners are parents, many of your listeners have teenagers, and all of us hear the same thing. My kids are both in high school. We hear the same thing. Mom, I'm the only one, I'm the only one who isn't on Snapchat. I'm the only one who doesn't have a smartphone. And so the kid feels left out and then parents give in because nobody wants their kid to feel left out. And so if you're alone, if it's just you making the decision, well, maybe you're hurting your kid, you don't know. But what if you and a few of your, uh, the parents of your kid's friends talked and you know what? We're all not gonna give our kids smartphones until high school, until 16. We're all gonna hold off. Well, then suddenly it's much easier to do. And so what I'm trying to do in the book is I'm trying to solve collective action problems so that we can actually all escape this tragedy together. And there are, there are four solutions that I propose, each of which solves a collective action problem. So the first is far more unsupervised play. You now, if you send your kid out to play in the park, you're going to get arrested because your kid's the only one out there and there's no one to play with. But if you organize it so that if you, if you have a town or a school that supports free-range kids, it supports free-range play, and you have multiple people sending their kids out to the school playground or to each other's houses. Uh, so you can solve the play problem collectively. It's even clearer when we look at the phones. No kid needs a phone at age 10, 11, 12. Now, they, they could use a, a basic phone to text to say, mom, I'm, I'll be home you know, at five o'clock, but nobody needs the internet. Nobody, no kid needs a smartphone in their pocket. So if we all just say no smartphones till high school, let's just agree on that. Don't give a smartphone Ooh. till high school. You can give a basic phone. If your kid is really out on, on her own, great. Give him a phone so you, know, you can keep in touch. But no smartphone until high school. That's the second one. A third is no social media till 16. Social media is incredibly bad for girls. I mean, the damage it's done to girls is greater than any public health threat we've ever seen. It's much bigger than lead gas, lead poisoning. Girls all over the world are much more depressed and anxious and self-harming and suicidal because of these phones. So, and, and especially the social media it hits the girls. So no social media till 16, which... You know, right now people might think, well, but everyone's on it. Well, yeah, but what if everyone wasn't on it? What if half the families in your town said, no, not until 16? Well, now suddenly your daughter's not the only one who's excluded. Half the kids are not on it. And guess what? They can meet up and actually have fun together. And then the last one, the last coordination device is phone-free schools. Every school 
K through 12, needs to say, you check your phone at the door, and then you have seven hours off. You have seven hours mm. in which you can attend to the teacher and you can attend to each other. What happens now is 72% of schools say that they ban phones. What they mean is, we have a rule that you shouldn't take your phone out during class, which is a joke because the kids are mm -hmm. so addicted. If anybody is texting, everybody has to be checking during class. So the kids are on during class, they're just, they just hide it. And then as soon as they get out of class, they're all on their phones instead of playing or talking to each other. So it's those four things, far more unsupervised free play, no smartphone till high school, no social media till 16, phone free schools. If we could do those, and those are all attainable, we would be living in a very different world and our kids' brains would not be so scrambled. You mentioned that uh, that social media particularly is, is much worse for girls than boys. Why is that? So girls' and boys' sociality is very, very different. Boys tend to do things together. When they get together, they do things. And so video games has taken over for the boys. Now, video games are not harmful to most boys, but they're incredibly harmful to five or 10% of them who get addicted. So this is, I know less about this. I've only begun to study this, this part more recently, but the boys are not really, they're not out doing pickup soccer games. They go home after school and they're on video games. They play several hours a day and five to 10% of them are severely damaged by that. Now, can you imagine a consumer product, a toy? Suppose there was a new toy. Oh yeah, it's incredibly fun. It's more fun than anything we've ever had. Five or 10% of the kids are gonna be damaged by it. Mm. But you know, whatever. No, of course, we would never do that. We would never allow a consumer product right. to damage five or 10% of the kids. So that's for the boys. They don't go in so much for posting photos of themselves and their perfect life. They just don't do that. Whereas girls, what happened in 2012, when they all got phones, the girls went straight for the visual platforms. Girls went for Instagram, Pinterest, you know, a couple others. And, and once they're posting photos, now it's all about how do you look? It's all about looks. Mm. It's so sad. You know, we made so much progress in the last 50 years of girls not just being sex objects, not just being judged for their beauty. And that's all gone now because the girls are completely obsessed with makeup and videos about how do I do skincare? I mean, it's so superficial. So the girls are all in these visual platforms. It's constant social comparison. And most girls are below average now because the average is not the real average. The, what you see, what every girl sees is all these beautiful girls with perfect lives. Mm. It's not real. It's all, it's all you know, manipulated to be as, as attractive as possible. So it's just been devastating for the girls for, for many reasons. That there's the eating disorder content. There's the bullying. There's the feeling of left out because you see on Snapchat, oh, everybody's over here and I wasn't invited. So social media really targeted if you think about, I mean, you know, I ask all your female listeners here, what was the worst year of school? Most of them are going to say seventh grade plus or minus. It, you know, it's around seventh and eighth grade is mm. the hardest. That's when girls have the most bullying. It's terrible. Imagine women listening to this podcast. Imagine if we took all the worst parts of what you remember about seventh grade and we made them 10 times worse. That's what your mm. daughters are going through. Mm. You know, one of the things that I've noticed is there, there are all these studies uh, showing that boys tend to trend right now conservative politically and girls tend to trend more progressive. And most of that is within normal bounds. But I've, I've noticed that when the extremes do happen with adolescents or college age kids, the, the girls tend to extreme left the sort of social justice That's warrior right. stuff that, that we've talked about. But the boys seem to be drawn to misogynistic, yes. A fascistic, That's right. often uh, explicitly racist, and sometimes even Nazi right. stuff. Right. So that you, there's someone, and, and it seems to me that that is, even for the kids who aren't drawn to it, I mean, my, my sons are <clears throat> more sheltered than 98% probably of, of people. And when somebody put up a meme of me next to Andrew Tate and mm. said, which way Western man, mm. my son immediately said, why is dad with Andrew Tate? Right. And my thought is, was, yeah. how do you know yeah. who that is? Yeah. Well, they all know. They so, all know. So why is that happening where there's this sort of both this extreme, this move to extremes, but also why is it going in these two different yes. directions? No, thank you. That is a question I'm thinking a lot about because my original research was on moral foundations theory, morality and politics, mm -hmm. tribalism. And it's tragic that we're seeing the split among our teenagers, this gender difference split among our teenagers. A lot of it, I believe, has to do with the nature of identitarianism. That is, 
you know, we might think of the left as being associated with socialism or communism back in the 20th century, but not anymore. It really became about identity, and I call it identitarianism, which is the idea that everything should be studied as a struggle between identity groups over power. What matters Ooh. is your race, your gender, LGBTQ status, all that. Now, this is a terrible way to think. This is an un-American way to think. This is a way that leads to constant conflict. It leads to depression and anxiety as well. What happens? When all the kids get on social media around 2012, Tumblr, and especially Tumblr, seems to be a real petri dish for nurturing these new ideas about identity, that your identity is something you construct, and if anyone disrespects it, then they've harmed you. No, identity can only be conferred by a community. Your identity is your position in society, traditionally. But these new ideas about identity and vulnerability come in, and it's the girls who embrace them. It's the girls on the left who embrace them, and they develop, they go in for intersectionality, they go in for seeing everything as a matrix of oppression. So even though things have been getting better and better for girls, suddenly around 2013, 2014, left-leaning girls think the world is now full of sexism, much more so than it, they did a few years ago. So they're going in for these identitarian ideas about struggle and oppression. Whereas the boys, generally, especially the white boys, the white boys are told, Identity is all that matters. Everyone has to think about their identity. Oh, you're white. Well, <laughs> don't identify with whiteness, otherwise you're bad. So I've seen this at some of the schools I've spoken at. The boys will be very quiet. They don't say anything in public because they're just going to be shamed and attacked. But in the age of the internet, they then go online and they see they go to people who say, no, you're not the bad ones, you're the good ones, they're the bad ones. And so the boys, in part because we keep beating on them, especially the white boys, especially in any progressive space, the white boys are always told, you're bad, you have to address your privilege, you shut up, you're taking up too much space. Well, that makes them very prone to recruitment by far-right extremists and misogynists. So this is a horrible state of affairs. Girls are moving to the left, as you said, boys are moving to the right, but guess what? Girls on the left will not date anyone who's not on the left. Girls who go to college won't date anyone who didn't go to college. Well, who's graduating from college? Mostly girls on the left. They're going to have nobody to marry. There's going to be a huge shortage for women on the left of anyone to marry. So we're going to see, we've already seen the sexes coming apart and not finding each other. And then we can talk about dating apps. The dating apps are able to drown you in possibilities, but yet somehow young people are having less and less sex and there's less and less marriage. And that was for the millennials. Now that we're talking about Gen Z, which is birth year 1996 and later, my prediction is the millennials are going to plummet in fertility and marriage and happiness. Mm. What about, you mentioned in the, in the anxious generation, you talk about porn. Mm -hmm. And one of the shifts that I have seen uh, just over the past few years is there were a lot of parents who were worried about porn and there were a lot of young people who were concerned about mm -hmm. porn in their own lives. And then there seemed to be this sort of shift where people started to think about porn just the way they think about masturbation. Mm -hmm. Eh, you know, that's just part, part of growing up. And I've seen that even with conservative evangelical Christian folks. They wouldn't articulate it that way, but that's kind of the attitude. Where is that yeah, going? Yeah. Well, first tell me, what year are you talking about? When did you see this shift? Are you talking like in the 90s? Or are you talking about the last five years? Oh, no. I'm talking about just within the last maybe two years. Oh, my. Okay. Okay. Because what, So I've just begun to study porn also. I was focused on social media for a long time. And only while writing the book did I realize, oh, my God, no, it's not just social media. For boys, it's video games and porn. The girls aren't watching. I mean, they see it, but almost no girls look at porn daily, whereas uh, you know, many or most boys look at porn daily. So porn turns out to be a huge problem. Now, I couldn't say too much about it in the book because there are almost no experiments. You can't do experiments on teenagers mm. in porn. You can't bring half into the lab and say, here, you go look at this. Right. Yeah. So, oh, so, I, so I didn't have a lot to go on in terms of the research. But the stories I'm hearing from, from young men about how they become addicted to porn, it makes them less likely to pursue a, a woman, a girl. It is scrambling their brain in the exact years. And so you would say addiction is a, is a proper term yes. in some of yes. these cases. Yes, there is some yeah. dispute as to whether addiction is the right word because neurochemically it's a little different. It is different from, say, a heroin addiction. But if you believe that gambling is an addiction, and of course it is, if you believe mm -hmm. that some people get addicted to slot machines, this is exactly the same. At least you know, the phone, social media is exactly the same. And then you bring in pornography, which goes much deeper into the brain, much deeper into deep, deep motives for, for sexuality. That boy, that adolescent boys are, 
you know, mad for. So from what I'm hearing and from what I was able to find in the research in the book, once kids become heavy users of porn, it makes them less interested in uh, in real women. It makes it harder for them to get aroused by a real woman because she's not nearly as perfect and not perfect, but, you know, unrealistically proportioned as, as girls on porn. And then something I haven't seen much about, but I think might be a big deal here, is it used to be that you had to use your imagination for a lot of things in the world. You know, like if you're playing Ooh. games with a friend and you have two sticks, you have to imagine a sword fight. But now you have a video game in which there's no imagination. It's just you have this incredibly Ooh. graphic war. It's amazing, but no imagination. Well, same thing with sex. You know, you, when you and I were young, the big thing was, you know, magazines. If you, somehow you had an older brother or something, you could somehow get a magazine. But, you know, then you had to use your imagination. That was it. But porn now is so graphic, so explicit, uh, so in your face if you go to these. St- and they all, you know, they've all gone to Pornhub. They all know Pornhub, there's no restriction. Anyone can go at any age. So I, I think there are so many things messing up our kids. To have them going through their peak years of sexual transformation and development on porn, I think, is another disaster that, that's, that's occurring all around us. Some people might be surprised you're uh, an atheist or mm-hmm. an agnostic, and you spend a lot of time uh, in the anxious generation talking about religious communities. Yes. Yes. And some people might be surprised by, I really wasn't surprised mm-hmm. by that, having read The Righteous Mind, yeah. but uh, but why why is that the case? Why mm-hmm. did you focus on yeah. that? Yeah, so, right, so I'm, you know, I'm Jewish. I, you know, like many Jews, you can be Jewish without believing in God. It was, it, it was, you know, it's an option. And so I was one of these, you know, scientifically minded, you know, young Jewish boys who went into the social sciences. And I, I had a prejudice against religion in general when I was young. And, uh, you know, I read the Hebrew Bible when I was in college and I was shocked by some of the things I read in, in the later books, you know, with genocide. So I was generally anti-religion in my twenties, but because I was studying morality, and the evolution of morality, I came to see that we evolved with religion and religion is is intimately part of our creating moral communities. And it was especially when I read works by um, uh, Robert Putnam and American Grace that religious people are better citizens, more socially minded. They give more to charity, not just in their own congregation, but even non-religious charities. And I really began to see, my God, the evidence about the benefits of religion for individuals and for communities is pretty large. I can't ignore this. So I, I came to have a lot of respect for religion. And my first book was The Happiness Hypothesis, which was about ancient wisdom. And so much of the world's wisdom is contained in religious texts. And I began to see that if you have a religious community that stretches back a long time, they have kind of purified or perfected wisdom about human development, about relationships, about, about consciousness. So I've come to respect religion more and more as I've gotten older. I belong to a synagogue in New York. My, my son was bar mitzvahed, but I am still an atheist or agnostic. To bring it back to your question about the anxious generation, I want to share with you now a result that I, I, I didn't put this graph in the book, but I'll be publicizing it when the book comes out. When we look at, when we look at teenagers, look at high school kids, what was their mental state? How depressed were they? You, you look back in, you know, the, in the 1990s, the early 2000s, it's, it's long been the case that religious kids are a little happier than non-religious kids. And that's certainly true for adults too. And it's also been true that conservatives are a little happier than liberals. That's been true for a long time. So you, you see these lines and you can see the slight differences until 2012. Then what happens? The secular liberals go skyrocketing up into mental illness, skyrocketing. I mean, huge increase, especially for the girls. Whereas this, the religious conservatives, they go up a little, but not much. And, and what that means, I think, is in 2012, roughly, is when the technology came like a tidal wave, like a tsunami, and it carried kids away. It just swept them away from each other, from their parents, from community, from tradition, from everything that came before, swept them off into this bizarre virtual world of terrible short videos and influencers and craziness and social comparison. Who didn't get swept swept away? The kids who had to be part of a community, had to go to church on Sunday, had to visit their grandparents or whatever. Actually, you tell me, you tell me, how is it that Christian kids are raised that you think might've kept them from being swept away the way the secular kids were? Well, I think many of the things that you you do mention in the book, although I see some of those things fraying in religious communities as okay, well. Tell me about it. What do you I see? Mean, but particularly uh, when it comes to, I found fascinating your section on rites of passage. Mm. 
And there in most uh, evangelical churches, there was a a basic structure of rites of passage that was more uniform, Mm. at least in certain traditions, than I see it being right now. Uh, where baptisms often are kind of, yeah, we're going to have a baptism after the service. If you want to come, come. That sort of a that sort of a thing. But I think it was maybe it was you. Uh, we we have a, a group of us that get together sometimes on on Thursdays and just talk. It was either you or maybe it was John Roush that talked about one of the reasons why midlife and older age is not as happy for people is because you have all of these rites of passage Mm -hmm. early in life and then it's over and there is no rite of passage until the funeral. Uh, (laughs) That was was John Rauch, yes. (laughs) That was John. I found that to be a fascinating Mm -hmm. uh, fascinating concept. But why are rites of passage important? Mm. So most societies have, they they see that you, you have a challenge. How do you turn a girl into a woman? How do you turn a boy into a man? And for girls, actually, if you just wait, they will menstruate. And then if you just wait, they will become fertile. And so most societies do have rites of passage and they're always keyed to menstruation. When a girl menstruates, all sorts of things happen. There will be a ceremony to welcome her in. She has to now get special knowledge that is reserved for women. It's not shared with girls. And interestingly, it's never the mother who does it. It's always gonna be another woman, not the mother. Mm. And because she's she has to be brought into the community of women. And it's always very, very gendered, okay? So, so that's the, the women's story is usually pretty simple and it's very similar across societies. The story for men is very, boys is very, very different because with boys, there's no menstruation. There's no obvious thing that happens. And the boys are all in the girl's world. The boys, when they're little, they're toddlers. They're surrounded by women who are caring for the kids and they're surrounded by sisters who are caring for the kids. So for them, they have to make a jump from these little soft, you know, girly things that don't look that different from girls and their bodies to a warrior. And how do you do that? So you have to have toughening. So rites of passage, they often have physical pain, puncturing the skin, going days in the woods, a survival challenge. So many societies have very harsh rites of passage for boys because they see you have to turn this soft little boy into a hard, strong man. And that takes several years. So I'm not saying we need that in our modern Western societies, but I came to see that if you just take away all that stuff and instead you say, okay, you know what? You just have birthdays. On your birthdays, we'll give you presents, but that's it. You're on your own. We'll give you no guidance in how to be a man or a woman. In fact, we're going to make people stop talking about men and women. Mm. When I was a kid growing up in the 60s and 70s, really, you know, my mother would sometimes say, you know, John, a gentleman would do this. And to my sister, you know, a lady would do this. Like, you know, in the circles I travel in, sort of, you know, progressive, educated, urban circles. Like, no one would dare say that. Everything has to be ungendered. And I think we're doing our kids a disservice. Girls need guidance on how to become a woman. Boys need guidance on how to become a man. Now, 5% of each are going to be gay and their interest is going to be same sex. That's, you know, that's wonderful that we now accept that and, and everyone can find marriage, everyone can find love. But even still, men and women are in different developmental trajectories. And in part because of our fear of gender, of, of saying something sexist, We've abandoned kids to sort of an agender, you know, no guidance adolescence. Adolescents need guidance. And so in the book, I proposed a plan for having steps on a ladder to adulthood where kids get more, they get more freedom, but they also have more responsibilities every, every even birthday. It's a little much to specify every single year, but I said, let's make a big deal out of every even birthday, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Mm. And at each step, you have a bigger deal. And it's not just a birthday present with presents. You might have more people gathering around. You say, okay, now you can do, you know, now we'll let you do this thing here. And now, you know, you can go out and work for money. Or now, we'll, Or I'll give you a bigger allowance in exchange for you doing more chores. But kids need to make progress and they need adults to guide them on the progress. Once they all got on phones, the amount of guidance we give them as parents dropped, for, let, let's suppose it was 20% of their input before, I don't know, make up a number. Suppose, you know, 30, 40 years ago, 20% of the input to a kid was from parents and you mm-hmm. know, 10% from teachers. Whatever, whatever numbers you want to make up, cut all those numbers by 90% once they get a phone because everything goes through the phone. And there's just very little input from adults. In my church, we didn't really have a uh, exciting sort of youth ministry, although to some degree, But there was a moment, and it wasn't really an official moment, but there was a moment 
when there were expectations suddenly from the church where suddenly you weren't a vacation Bible school child anymore. You were expected to be part of the disaster relief stuff Mm. or part of the taking up of the offering or something like that. And that sense of responsibility, I think at least in my case, really gave me a sense of membership and belonging in a way that doing fun things that Mm -hmm. I would want to do wouldn't have done. So so tell me more about that, because this is very, very important. One of the things we're seeing from young people today is that they feel their lives are meaningless. They have no value to anyone else. They have no sense of purpose. Are you saying that at a certain point, they would just call on you to go on some mission to help help other people? Or was it at a certain age? Was it a certain grade? Was it at confirmation? When was it? It was just, a, there was a certain moment when I don't even think you would you would notice it in terms of marking a before and an after, but there was just a certain point where you were invited, not just invited, you were kind of expected to be a part of things that other okay. people in the church Was uh, this were around age 14? In. Like, when would you say it was? Yeah, it was, yeah, maybe 12, 13, somewhere yeah. in, okay. in there. Yeah, so it's when, so it would be you know, both their bodies and their minds that are really changing in that period of early puberty. You know, age 11 to 14 is when the changes really start for both sexes, boys a little bit later. And so, and they're they're ready for more adult responsibility and they thrive if they're given it because that's how they learn that actually they matter, what they do matters. And what we've done to our kids now is we've said, you know what, I'm investing everything in you. I want you to get into college, but mm-hmm. you know, it's all about you. And kids can't thrive that way. They can't thrive if we just give them stuff. They have to feel generative. They have to feel a sense of effectance that they can make a mark on the world. Uh, And it sounds like your community did that. Actually, I'd love to talk with you about how Christian communities could, not, not fight back, that's not quite the right word. How could Christian communities adapt to this current technological onslaught and raise better kids? Because I think that religious communities, whether you're Orthodox Jews or evangelical Christians, they have moral resources and structure and and parental influence far beyond what we have in secular culture. And it's gonna be really hard to to restore childhood in secular circles, but I think religious communities could do it. You've read the book. We're talking here about Mm -hmm. Christian communities. What do you think, what advice could you and I work up to give to Christian parents uh, and let's focus on, you know, if your kids are, you know, eight, nine, 10 years old, that's about when they're going to, they're about to get a phone. What do you think we can do? You know, I think one of the things that we will need, and you did this in the book, I, I found I, it was striking that you sort of, you, you went through and you mentioned it here earlier, from age one to 18 months, only screen is a FaceTime with another adult Mm -hmm. or something like that. And then you had these benchmarks. And that's one of the things I think there are a lot of parents uh, and a lot of people in ministry who don't feel like they have the authority because there's a kind of legalism that that sort of misuses uh, authority to to come in and say, well, this is what you do until this age, and this. So so no one wants to do that, mm-hmm. which means that parents are sometimes uh, wondering, well, what is the, what should I do, mm-hmm. and ha- how should I do it? And I think a lot of times, adolescents and college age kids, it's the same thing. There's often not a template that's specific enough. Okay. That a that somebody could come in and alter it if it wasn't appropriate for them, but at least to have it. Okay. And I think one of the things too that is going to be increasingly necessary in Christian communities, you know, I don't agree with Jordan Peterson on, on a lot of things, but one of the things that I heard him say that I think is true is about the shift from having grandparents close mm-hmm. by. Yeah not just for the grandkids, but for the parents, because there's a certain aspect of, of the kind of counsel that grandparent gives to his adult son or mm. daughter to say, yeah, this is not a big deal. Mm, mm-hmm. Because so much of it is trying to figure out, yeah. and I think both if you're going through it and if you're parenting through it, you don't know what's a five alarm fire, Mm -hmm. what is just a normal part of adolescence. And so having the the kind a kind of replacement when it's not there of grandparenting 
yeah. with it. And we, we spend a lot of time talking about spiritual parenting, fathering and mothering, but not a lot of time about spiritual grandparenting. Mm. And I think there's something about that that we need to reclaim mm-hmm. that, that I think has been present in a lot of Christian traditions, but in some of them is being lost. Okay, that's, that's great. That's a real way forward because one of my concerns, it, it didn't make it into a chapter in this book, but it'll be in my next book, Life After Babel, will be a chapter on wisdom deprivation disorder. How Mm. in order to thrive, in order to live a full human life, you can't just invent everything yourself. You have to come into a tradition. Now, you know, you change the tradition with each generation, the tradition changes, but you have to have a a tradition that you were born into, that binds you uh, and forms you, and then you can alter it perhaps. And what's happened in recent years, in recent decades, I should say, is the almost complete cutting off of everything before five minutes ago. But, and especially in a Christian household, obviously you have the Bible, you have words and ideas from long ago interpreted by people from decades or centuries ago. So, so you have much more of a connection to the past in a Christian house, in a religious household, I should say. And I think what you just pointed out is just having grandparents around serves that same function. It's a connection to ideas from the past. Because if you have to run everything based just on things that we've learned in the last five minutes, you're just gonna flounder, you're just gonna be lost. You're gonna be, you know, there are so many terrible ideas floating around that are gonna be gone tomorrow. But if if you're immersed in them, as anyone is who's on TikTok or Instagram, you're surrounded by terrible ideas and you don't know what's what. And so yeah, to have a grandparent say, you know, that's all silly, all you need to do is this or whatever, just to have, have that perspective from decades ago is incredibly valuable. When we're mm-hmm. together, we share emotions, we share experiences, and that happens in a community. But when kids are connected just on a network, well, they're going to share emotions too. But so much of it is so negative, so dark. Everything's terrible. Everything's oppression. Everything is ecological disaster. So negative emotions are stronger than positive emotions. They're also more contagious. So that's yet one more reason why we shouldn't hook kids up, uh, let them hook each other, hook themselves up on networks to each other to share negative thoughts much better to have them in real physical communities following moral exemplars and hearing testimonies from people who are grateful. That's contagious too. Jonathan Haidt is the author of the book that's coming out uh, soon, The Anxious Generation, How the Great Rewiring of Childhood is Causing an Epidemic of Mental Illness. The book comes out March 26, 2024. Jonathan Haidt, thanks so much for being with us. Russell, always a pleasure. Thank you. The Russell Moore Show is a production of Christianity Today. Executive producers are Eric Petrick, Russell Moore, and Mike Cosper. Host, Russell Moore. Producer, Ashley Hales. Associate producer, Abby Perry. Director of Operations for CT Media is Matt Stevens. Audio engineering is provided by Dan Phelps. Our video producer is Abby Egan. And the theme song for The Russell Moore Show is Dusty Delta Day by Lennon Hutton.